It's a joy to have Drew Eastus with us today. Um, I've asked Drew to join us because he did his MDiv at Duke, and his master's thesis was on the preaching of Ray H. Hughes. Uh, before we go further, uh, Drew, what else do we need to know about you? Sure. Uh, spent many years in evangelist in the Church of God, For did that for 13 years. Now I'm on staff at a church, so uh, I'm a preacher, study preaching. That's pretty much my life. And you're trying to complete your THD? I am, yes, in the exam stage of that now. So you all pray for me. Very good. Um, Drew, when I'm preparing for this class, one of the things I did is I thought in my mind who were the greatest, most influential Pentecostal preachers of the movement. And uh, I, in my own mind, I determined that it was Amy Simple McPherson, Ray Hughes, and probably T.D. Jakes at the moment. One of the things that I found interesting is I asked several of my colleagues in academics the same question. Who do you think was the three most influential preachers of the Pentecostal movement? And everybody I asked gave me the same, two of the same answers, Amy Simple McPherson and Ray Hughes. Um, so my point here is the topic of our conversation, Ray Hughes, uh, is widely recognized as one of the great influential preachers of, uh, of the movement. So um, tell me, why did you find um, doing research on the preaching of Ray Hughes? Why was it important to you? Well, when I started preaching years ago, I was 13, and someone gave me a book, Pentecostal Preaching by Ray Hughes. And Although I, I got to admit that the book doesn't give all the mechanics you actually need to start writing a sermon. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend that practice of how I did that. But the thing it did was it, it described Pentecostal preaching in a way that when I read it, I went, yeah, yeah, that's it right there. He's got it. He's onto something there. And it helped me understand the tradition in a way. So I wanted to go deeper into that and actually figure out how does he actually write a sermon? How does he actually do what he did uh, and think what he thinks? And that ultimately shaped the, the project. You'll be happy to know that uh, Hughes's book, Pentecostal Preaching, was the very first preaching text I ever read as a young preacher when I was 17 or 18 years old. Okay, um, great. And I, and I remember, you know, I'm old enough that I remember I was in present with Hughes uh, preaching. Um, and I, I, I've, I've uh, told this many times. I remember him preaching at my home church, the Baxley Church of God in South Georgia. I remember him walking to the pulpit, standing there. He had a presence about himself. He said, turn in your Bibles to Matthew 25 and proceeded to quote the entire chapter and then preach an hour, a sermon on the 10 virgins. And, you know, me as 16, 17 years old, sitting on the edge of my seat, every word Ray Hughes spoke. Uh, was a, a word we will use anointed. I mean, there was this power, there was this authority. Uh, he had a presence as a preacher. And uh, as some of our students may not know, most of us will know, however, that Ray Hughes was a three-time general overseer of the Church of God, that he was the president of the National Association of Evangelicals for a term. Uh, so his influence uh, is, is wi much wider than the Pentecostal movement. So the questions I want to ask you here, uh, as we look at your research and as the, what you have discovered about Hughes, um, uh, how important do you think that the preaching of Ray Hughes uh, was to the Pentecostal movement? It was very important because in a, many ways it shaped a generation of preachers. So he's preaching camp meetings all the time. Uh, he preached four different general assemblies, eight different Pentecostal world conferences. On top of that, he was the radio preacher from 1960 to 1963, doing the Ford and Faith radio broadcast. And so he's a very prominent preacher. At the end of his life, he, he estimated that he had traveled 7.5 million miles preaching the gospel uh, wow. throughout his life, um, which is remarkable. Yeah, let me just point out, and I know this because I'm an Elvis fan, Elvis Presley traveled a little over 4 million miles in his career. So Ray Hughes actually traveled more than Elvis Presley did. Yeah, anytime you double Elvis, you've done something. <laughs> and so it's, it's remarkable, but beyond the, the proclamation itself, there's also the fact he's involved in education. So two times he's president of Lee from 60 to 66, and again, 82, 84. Then he comes to the seminary there for a couple of years as well. 
And so he's preaching in those chapel services and you have a young generation of preachers that are getting to hear Ray Hughes three times a week back in the sixties. And so they grow up learning how to preach, finding their own voice, listening to him three times a week. And so you see the influence you can have there uh, through his education, the involvement in education. But also he's publishing sermons as well. So those, those radio sermons from the 60s were all manuscripted out. They were only 13 minutes is all they were allowed on the radio broadcast. So he wrote it all out word for word, and then he turned around and published them. And so many of the published manuscripts we have of him is from that. But, but the point is, you've got 60 years since then that people have been reading his, his sermons and continuing to have an influence there as well. We should point out that for those who are interested, um, there are many of his sermons that have been uploaded to YouTube. And right. you can do a, a, you can just do a quick YouTube search. And there are many of those sermons there. Also the Pentecostal Resource Center has many of those sermons digitized and any student of preaching uh, would be benefited from taking a look at that. Um, as you know, uh, and we all know, uh, Hughes was a student of preaching. He was not just a preacher. And that led to him writing this book, Pentecostal Preaching. Um, so what do you think that Hughes believed were distinctives of Pentecostal preaching? The main thing, when he gets to that last chapter, the uniqueness of Pentecostal preaching, he emphasizes three aspects of Pentecostal preaching. The first two more normal, uh, by normal Christian standards, that's the centrality of the word and exalting Christ. But the third one there is really the thing he lingers on, discussing the leading and empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And now, to be fair, many different traditions believe the Holy Spirit's involved in preaching, but it's how Hughes thought about that that's so unique. Uh, particularly, he said it very bluntly, there should be supernatural power. And by that, he meant there should be miracles taking place, there will be gifts of the Spirit, there will be things happening. And of course, that puts an indictment upon the preacher. You've got to respond to that in some way. And so that changes the whole preaching task. You're, you're, you're not just speaking a monologue to people, but you're responding to God in the moment as well as responding to the people, right? And so it takes on a unique sort of uh, flair whenever you're trying to respond to God in the moment. And he has all these stories he tells of people getting out of wheelchairs and, mm. and people speaking in tongues and having to give interpretation and, and these sorts of things happening in the middle of the sermon. And that took on a unique flair for him that there's something happening that's not just me up here. And to him, that's what made it unique. I think that Hughes embodies um, a classical Pentecostal preacher. Um, there are others, but I think that Hughes embodies that. Um, the thing that strikes me about Hughes, and you mentioned that other Christian traditions believe that the Spirit is encountered in the preaching of the Word. In fact, Reformed churches would say that's the primary way that the Spirit is encountered in the church is through the preached word. Right. Um, but I think what makes Hughes distinctive is that Pentecostal distinctive in that for him, um, the preached word leads to an unmediated encounter with the Spirit, that, that by responding to the word, the preached word inspires us, the preached word draws us. But what I think Hughes and for what Pentecostal preaching, what we want to do is bring the hearer into an unmediated encounter to respond to God so they can, they can encounter the Holy Spirit in a very real, personal way. What do you think about that? Absolutely so. And that's why he was so big at the end about, he would talk about a definite appeal. Whenever you go to the altar call, there needs to be a definite appeal that pushes people to respond to God because it's not just them responding to you, it's them responding to God. God is here. Uh, and what's great, too, he has this great phrase when he talks about the Holy Spirit showing up in, in miracles and things like this and in very real and mediated ways. He calls it interruptions of the Spirit. So he talks about, he would say, my preaching got interrupted because God showed up and did this, this, this. And, and it's just, I think, a great term to describe. You know, he's not planning on this happening per se. He hopes it happens, but then it does. God shows up. You know, uh, one of the uh, distinctions or one of the changes that we've seen in Pentecostal worship and Pentecostal churches over the last decade or so a lot of our, I don't mean this overly critical, but I'm being critical, but a lot of our pastors um, are no longer ending services with altar calls. I go to a lot of Pentecostal churches where the pastor preaches a sermon and then prays a benediction and people leave. Can you imagine Ray Hughes doing that? No, 
Uh, in fact, it was one of the things he harped on more than anything was the importance of the conclusion, he would call it. But he would say this, he'd say the conclusion is not just the summary of what the sermon talked about. It's a definite appeal asking people to respond to God. That's the way he defined a conclusion. And he had this great quote uh, about the importance of that at the end. He said, it doesn't matter how nice the flight is if the plane doesn't land well. And to him, any plane that didn't land in the altar, any sermon that didn't end up in an altar call, what was the point? It's got to come down on the ground and make a difference in lives. Right. So how do you think, I know you did this, did this study, and we've talked a few times, and I've heard you make a few presentations, um, but how do you think uh, Ray Hughes challenged the conventional notions of preaching in the 50s and 60s? Yeah. So I don't think he's necessarily a, an innovator in the Pentecostal tradition. I think he's, in many ways, one of the most perfect embodiments of it. But if you look at what he's doing in comparison to the broader homiletical landscape, it's really remarkable. Um, so, for instance, he's rooting his whole idea of preaching in spirituality. So he has this notion that there's the operational power of preaching, that's the Holy Spirit, and then there's the foundational power of preaching, and that's the Word. And he says, listen, basically the sermon is only effective if you're filled with the Word and if you are sensitive to the Spirit, which is cultivated through prayer. And so for him, he says, before you can prepare the sermon, you have to prepare yourself. And therefore, really, homiletics is not about writing a sermon, teaching people how to do that. It's more so about preparing people. Before you ever get to the piece of paper, it's about your heart. Uh, that's remarkable because he's not interested necessarily even in this book about sermon form. He has a page on sermon form. Now, when you put that in context, that's remarkable because you, it, it, this book came out in 1981. In 1978, you've got Fred Craddock writing as one without authority, and it's all about inductive movement and sermons. And in 1980, you've got Gene Lowry doing the homiletical plot, all about sermon form. And then in 1981, Ray Hughes comes along and has one page on that, but he's really interested in your heart. And we should note that it was not that Hughes was ignorant of what Craddock was doing. Right. Because Hughes, those who knew him, very, very informed, very educated man. Absolutely. Absolutely. But it just showed that the heartbeat of the Pentecostal movement was, listen, the perfect sermon form is not going to make you have an encounter with God. Did you pray this morning? That will make the difference. And it's just such a different message than what other people are saying at that time in terms of what's important. So I'm interested. You're a young Pentecostal preacher, a revivalist. Um, you're, of course, serving at a local church now, but revival is in your heart. That's, that's who you are as a preacher. Um, since you mentioned uh, Hughes in the context of Craddock and in the context of this inductive preaching, um, how would you view the uh, trajectory that many preachers have made uh, since Craddock's book uh, uh, to embrace the inductive model? Do you think that's something Ray Hughes would have been comfortable with? Hughes would have used anything that he felt like God could could use. Uh, but that being said, he didn't have a problem with just outright saying up front, this is what I think, now let me tell you why I think it. There was a certain conviction there. And, and there's been some, um, you know, Craddock's main concern was this. I'll put it this way. Craddock's main concern was preaching in my context, Craddock's context, has gotten boring. Here's how we make it more interesting. And since then, people like uh, LaRue up at, Princeton have pushed back on that and said, okay, just because it's boring in your church don't mean it's boring in my church. And so I think Hughes would say, listen, my people can still listen to deductive preaching and, and give a big amen, just like they would an inductive sermon. We don't need that to be interesting. Uh, I don't know that he would be against it, but I think for him, it wouldn't be necessary for this to be interesting. You know, I think that's, that's an important point in preparing for this class and doing this, all this research. One of the things that I've come across, you know, there are all these suggested forms, all of these suggested types of sermons. But I think that if there is anything distinctive about Pentecostalism is that it defies a sermonic form. Um, that, that I think, you know, we talk about that the purpose of a Pentecostal sermon, the preacher has to re-experience the text, this living and active word. And the job of the preacher is to get the congregation to experience the text. Um, so let me ask you this. Um, keeping this conversation in mind with, with going back to Ray Hughes, um, how do you think Ray Hughes 
uh, preaching, his style, the way he informs preaching, how do you think it might inform Pentecostal preaching in the 21st century? Let me, ask, let me put it this way. Why is a guy like you, a young man in the church, looking back to Ray Hughes, who was prominent in the 50s and 60s? Why is that important, and how does it inform your ministry today? Great question. There are two things I would say there. Well, three. The first being the spirituality aspect. I think it's so critical that we remember the formation of us as people is far more important than necessarily what we have written down on the piece of paper. Not that what we have written down on a piece of paper doesn't matter. I'm a homiletician. I teach people how to write things on that piece of paper that matters. But uh, if your heart's not in the right place, who cares what's written on paper? And I think Hughes is a great reminder of that. Uh, secondly, the improvisation piece, I think, is so critical. And it's something I think really in a lot of Pentecostal circles we're losing. You read the early literature and the early evangel, things from Tomlinson and his journal, and you see this all the time, and in Hughes you see it all the time, of this notion of we're prepared that when God shows up, if God drops something in my heart I didn't prepare to say, if God heals somebody on the third row, that we're going to go with that. We're going to adapt what we have prepared to suit what God's doing. And that doesn't happen haphazardly, man. That's part of my interest in Hughes is when he went through BTS and learned all those scripture verses like he did, he had that in him so that when things happened, he could improvise. He, he had it in him to come out. He, wasn't, he didn't just have what was written in front of him, but there was something in his heart that he could pour out. And I think there's something to be said for that. that if we're going to be people of the Spirit that follow the leading of the Spirit, we have to prepare ourselves. There are things we need to learn, things we need to have in our heart uh, that when the moment comes, we can flow with that. And the third thing I'll say that I love about Ray Hughes is he drew people into the experience of Scripture. He's talking about re-experiencing the text and re-experience and encountering God through that. He, he did that in very creative ways that I think practically are really helpful now. So he wouldn't just say a theological thesis. Instead, he would either tell the story in a very creative way or he would come up with a creative conversation. Let me, let me give you an example. So if he wanted to tell you the blood of Jesus could forgive all sins, he wouldn't just say that sentence. Instead, in like, what meaneth these wounds? That was one of his famous earlier sermons. He would have a whole conversation with the Roman soldier that's beaten Jesus. And he would say, hey, don't you hear what that blood's saying? Listen to it. Oh, it's saying that victory has been won. It's saying that all sins are forgiven, right? He would find ways to weave it in so that it drew you in. It wasn't just a something you encountered with your head, but emotionally you were engaged with it. Another example is like when he, anytime he would describe the cross, anytime Ray Hughes describes the cross, you feel like you're sitting at the foot of the cross when it happened. And he'll talk about the thud of the hammer and you could t hear the, the tendons tearing and that kind of thing. And, and he did it in such a way that you experienced the biblical text. Theologically deep, great conviction, but it was creative enough that it would draw you in. Do you think, again, you've said this, and being one who heard him preach, it's absolutely true. Uh, Ray Hughes had a powerful presence uh, behind the pulpit. I mean, he had a presence when he walked in the room. This was a guy, when he walked in the room, people would stop talking, and, you know, it was just who he was. Um, you know, we're in this postmodern era where there's this tendency to resist any kind of hierarchical notions. Uh, one of the uh, criticisms that many people place uh, uh, against inductive uh, types of preaching is this um, freedom it gives for the congregation to make its own decisions about what's been preached. Um, and that's one of my criticisms because I think that the goal of preaching is to convince, to proclaim and convince. Um, do you think, uh, and I'm asking you as a, as a younger man, uh, who's engaged in the pre preaching task today, do you think there is room, a place in postmodernity for this declaration of truth that Ray Hughes would have been very comfortable with? Sure, I do, uh, very much so. And again, I think it has to do with context. There are certain communities that are still going to be more inclined to hear a sermon like that. And at the same time, there are going to be communities that increasingly aren't going to be comfortable with that. I, I have found the Holy Spirit can work through a myriad of ways. And 
So that's why I never level myself down to just one way of doing it. Somebody asked me once, are you deductive or inductive? And I answered, yes. It just depends on where I'm at and what I need to do to get the point across. And I trust the Holy Spirit to do that work in terms of them come to the conclusion in those instances. But I do think there's, there's room for it. And I think what makes it easier to swallow nowadays for some communities would be that creative way that he would do that, where he would have these conversations and he would give these descriptions. And even though he's given you these big ideas, you're engrossed in the experience of the thing, right? So he's not just coming out and saying, Jesus saves all and you need to believe it right now. He's drawing you into this story and you're standing next to the Roman soldier and the blood's telling you that. It's not him, it's the blood that's coming out of Jesus' back that's telling you that. All right, it's just a really interesting way to go about it. Um, but it gets to the same point, right? Uh, you, you said something else I think that is important. Um, Hughes was always, always had a theological depth. Yeah. Um, in fact, you know, um, looking at uh, articles written in the evangels in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, uh, most of the Pentecostal preachers of those ages had a theological depth that I, I fear is missing in the preaching today. So I want to ask you one final question, and uh, we're addressing this particular question. If you're talking to my students in this, this preaching class, Ministry of the Word, um, how important uh, in your judgment is maintaining a theological depth and having a theological conversation? to the preaching task in post-modernity? Oh man, uh, very critical. And that's really the, the beauty of Ray Hughes to me is you can have theological depth without losing rhetorical power. In other words, you, you, to be theological doesn't mean you have to be boring. You can have theological richness in creative ways, but people need to know what they think. People need to know what Christians think, right? And, and they need to be taught that because people just don't know. And the great thing about Ray Hughes is he can take something like the virgin birth, for instance, and he'll start out talking about how he talked to a pastor the other day who denied the virgin birth. And then he'll just preach about it and explain why it matters and all this. But he does it in such a rich, rhetorically pleasing way that you want to listen to it. It doesn't sound like, a, like, a, like some boring, very lecture of some sort. So I, I think that's the beauty of Ray Hughes, that rhetorical pleasure and theological depth aren't enemies. One more question. Uh, as a guy who's got an education from Lee University, a Master of Divinity from Duke, so your educational background uh, is varied. You have a diverse uh, ecumenical uh, education. Um, how can Pentecostals navigate uh, the new reality of ecumenism uh, in postmodernity? Uh, what kind of counsel would you give a young Pentecostal scholar who's interested in preaching and uh, maintaining that, the, that Pentecostal identity? Be yourself. And I say that because in spaces like Duke, that's a hard thing to do sometimes because you, you, there are things that we as Pentecostals believe that other folks don't. And there's a certain pressure to kind of give into that. But I think one of the beauty, uh, one of the beauties of ecumenism and this kind of thing is everyone having a seat at the table, but in order for that to be meaningful, we have to be ourselves. We can't be something else. And I, I remember a, a great story. I preached a sermon at Duke. And I mentioned miracles in passing. And the professor afterwards come to me and said, hey, you know, Drew, you can't, you, you, you can't say that. Um, and I said, well, well, why can't I talk about that? He said, well, you know, the metaphor of a miracle just doesn't really help anything here. You know, there's real pain out there and some empty metaphor like miracle just doesn't mean anything. And I looked at him, I said, who told you it was a metaphor? And his eyes got big. He said, oh, God, you're Pentecostal, aren't you? <laughs> yes. He said, so you, when you said miracle, you meant miracle. I said, yes, I did. He said, never mind. Say what you want. You know, and I think that um, in, in this postmodern era, uh, when people are full of doubts, I think they're ready for something that will wow them. And I think that there is truth and the reality of God. I think that, that the gospel still has the power to save, and I'm grateful for that. 
Drew, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a wonderful conversation. Uh, I know you'll do well as you complete your THD. God bless you. And again, thank you for joining us, my friend. Bless you, my friend. Appreciate the opportunity.